Marta is an accomplished entrepreneur, keynote speaker, radio and TV host, and a lifestyle brand. With her various broadcasting and publishing platforms, she creates valuable connections with Spanish-speaking audiences, making her one of the most influential voices in Mexico. Please give a warm welcome to Marta de Baile. Good afternoon, everybody, and I'm so happy for you to be here. So this invitation has a very personal meaning, and I am both honored and thrilled, and I want to start by telling you why it's so special for me to be here today in this building, on this beautiful campus, and to share my knowledge with this amazing group of young people from all Latin America. So, my father graduated with a degree in economics in 1959. My older brother studied not one, but two master's degrees here. So in my family, coming to Harvard got you a golden star. So the last time I was visiting the campus, I FaceTimed my dad. He answered, and I was like, do you recognize where I am? And I was standing in front of his dorm, which was Elliott House, and he immediately recognized the building, and I said, Dad, why did you ruin my future? Why didn't you send me to Harvard? This is, this is so me. Now, the only issue is that I graduated high school with 7.3 out of 10. Like, I literally barely passed, so obviously, I was nowhere near Harvard. <laughs> so, growing up, that is what I saw. And I had to fight the urge to judge myself against my family and others of what they had accomplished. And, you know, I didn't graduate from Harvard or MIT or BU because guess what? I didn't graduate. I dropped out of college and obviously I missed the amazing opportunity of gathering all the knowledge that would have made my business learning curve so much easier to handle. And I'll tell you what I say to my daughters today. Preparation does matter. And honestly, there is no better preparation than the one you're getting today at your schools. But don't shed a tear for me yet. <laughs> because my story, the fact that I'm standing here today, is testament to the fact that we're all on our own paths and that each is as valid and as deserving as the next. Our lives, whether in business or any other endeavor, are going to have highs and lows, moments of triumph and moments that test us. But whatever challenges or trials come your way, whatever uncertainty, I can promise that if you listen to yourself recognizing and paying attention to what your inner voice is telling you will always give you a more reliable way forward than comparing where you are on your path to where the people that you know are on theirs. So I want to tell you about how in the absence of having learned and picked up all the tools and knowledge that you're picking up at your schools, I learned to harness my intuition, to make the decisions that were right for me at critical stages in my professional life. And I want to share with you my four fundamental keys to doing the same in your own lives. And we'll go from the easiest decision and the hardest decision I've ever made in my professional life, and I want to see which one of them you can relate to more. So, in the year 2000, I was 32 years old. I'm 55 right now, and fabulous. I was divorced, thank you. So I was divorced, I had two daughters, one sitting right there in front of me, and I had a part-time job with a very crummy pay. But I also had finally started something on my own that made me feel like I was in the right place, something that I could be successful at and that I knew could make a real difference in people's lives. That something 
was called Bebemundo.com. And it was a website with information and tips for young parents who were living through the same stresses and uncertainty and times of terror that I was living through trying to raise my two girls on my own and not being sure if I was making the right choices. So I spent basically all of my savings to get that website started. I'd call in favors and look for writers and even bribed a couple of web designers with pizza because I didn't have enough money to pay them what they were worth. And I scratched and clawed and eventually I got Bebemundo off the ground. So just as I was getting started and way before it was obvious that Bebemundo was ever gonna turn profit, Someone I knew who worked for a pretty big international consumer product company that you all know, um, whose name I will not say, invited me to lunch in a very fancy restaurant in Mexico City. And I didn't know exactly why he wanted to see me, but somewhere between the appetizer and the entrees, he looked at me square in the eye and said, you know what, Marta, we think that Bebemundo could be a good fit for us. We want to buy a piece of it. It would be a great commercial window for our baby brands. What would you say to half a million dollars? Now, I can't overstate how badly I needed that money. Really bad. I had a four-year-old, a one-year-old at home whose future depended on me. And here I was in front of a guy who was offering me half a million dollars for half of a website that barely even existed. And the instant he said it, the moment the words came out of his mouth, in big bright letters, in my mind, I saw the response. Absolutely not. Now, looking back on it now, I can understand some of the reasons why I had that immediate reaction, because Bebemundo was something I believe in and I had committed to myself because I knew that if I said yes to that offer, my idea and Bebemundo's big mission, which was supposed to be a content and educational resource for young parents, would be turned into just another way for people to sell products. Also, if I'm totally honest, I had that reaction because somewhere Deep inside me, I knew Bebemundo's real potential, and I knew that, crazy as it might have seemed at the time, half a million dollars wasn't anywhere close to what it's going to be worth someday if I stuck with it. In that moment, though, I wouldn't have been able to put any of that into words. I knew I didn't want to sell because I just knew I didn't. It just didn't feel right. Now. I'm polite, so instead of saying, you know, just buzz off, I told him, I'll think about it. And that's when all the doubts started creeping in. Not my own doubts. At first, the doubts of people around me. Everyone, and I mean everyone without exception, told me I'd hit the jackpot. My friends who work for amazing consultancies, uh, people who gave me advice in putting the website together, my family members, every single one told me to sell. Funnily enough, a lot of those people were the same ones that had told me I shouldn't even have started the website in the first place. And the worst thing is that their doubts started becoming my doubts. And maybe I was being foolish. Maybe Bebemundo wasn't ever going to become what I thought it would be. I started looking at my friends who were financially secure, and I thought about how much I had been struggling all those months, and I thought maybe I really am an idiot if I'm willing to give this up, if I'm going to say no to that. And my heart started to sing. And I was sleeping terribly, waking up in the middle of the night with a knot in my stomach and my mind going a mile a minute. But finally, after a week, a sort of calm came over me and I called up this guy and I told him, there is no deal. So he was disappointed, he wished me well. I hung up the phone, I went out to dinner. 
I got home, took a long shower, and let me tell you, that day, I slept like a baby. All of the noise around me just had stopped, and that knot in my stomach just went away. Now, I am telling you this story because I was invited here today to speak to you about the power of intuition in business. And whether you're thinking about starting a company or you're starting a company or you're hoping to one day be an executive or even if you've already founded your own startup, I think you're already familiar with that intuition and what it feels like with the sensation of simply knowing the right answer or the best way to move forward or that tingle in your nose that tells you something is off. And I'm here partly to convince you of how valuable that is, but also to remind you that the challenge you face isn't just having intuition. It is recognizing your intuition, learning how to access it, knowing when to trust it and when to not. And that decision to not sell Bebemundo was for me the easiest decision I've ever made in my life because I knew in an instant what the right answer was. And it was the hardest decision I ever made because every piece of data, every colleague, every voice was telling me I was wrong. Something tells me that you can relate to that in some way in some part of your personal lives. The question is, what does that mean for a business? So it's the four keys to harnessing your intuition in business. And the first one, and the most obvious one, but is also the most important, learn how to trust yourself. I found in my career, time and time again, that the right decision isn't always the most popular. And that's easy to do something while everyone around you is applauding. But real leadership and real success comes first to those who are willing to move forward despite criticism or even despite mockery or eye rolls or silence when they have to. In Blink, I suppose many of you have read that book from Malcolm Gladwell, he says, Insight is not a light bulb that goes off inside our heads. It is a flickering candle that can easily be snuffed out. And I think that part of what he means is that there are a lot of other factors in our lives, both internal and external, that can convince us not to listen to what our inner voice is saying. They push us to dismiss our own intuition as being either less important than what other people think or want or say, or what we're supposed to do, or what you read about on social media. And that is so dangerous and so specially true today for your generation, because every decision you make is so immediately public and on display for your generation, for instance, how is this going to make me look has taken a whole different meaning. And it's not just your friends or your family you have to think about. It's the whole technological ecosystem that likes nothing more than to knock people down. So following your inner voice is scary now more than ever, and I get that. But to get what you want, you won't be able to avoid sticking your neck out. You're going to have to learn sooner or later how to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Because in your professional lives, you are going to be giving a thousand and one reasons not to make the big decisions, not to take risks, not to be bold, and it will be only up to you what you do with that and how you decide to respond. And my hope is that you'll have the courage to follow your intuition. But let's think just for one minute, what does really intuition mean? What is intuition and what isn't? 
Simply put, intuition is defined as the ability to understand something immediately without the need for conscious reasoning. And I think we underestimate what a huge part of our lives intuition really is. On any given day, we make about 100 conscious decisions, but we make as many as 35,000 unconscious decisions just in one day. And it's just not the small things. Gary Klein, a research psychologist who studies the use of intuition in business, believes that 90% of the truly important decisions we make in our lives are based on some degree on intuition. For him, far from being an innate sixth sense or you know, something that you just feel, it is an essential learnable skill. It is the ability of the mind to subconsciously recognize patterns and decipher countless other direct and indirect cues to be able to arrive at decisions quickly and effectively. So intuition then is a natural extension of our knowledge and the diversity of all our experience. And if that's the case, and if intuition is a learnable skill, if it is really something that grows and develops as we do, that means that harnessing your intuition takes work. Now, I have one rock solid, nailed on, gold standard rule for success, and it is that your business will only work for you as long as you work for your business. So the second key to harnessing your intuition to recognize and accept that intuition is not a substitute for hard work, but it is a product of hard work. When I started Bebemundo, we were in the middle of the dot-com crash, and I know it sounds strange to you all, but yes, there was a time where we didn't still know how much of a thing internet was gonna be. This was the summer of 2000. And at that time, I was totally immersed in life as a young mother. Not only did I have two kids at home, but I also hosted a segment on national television called Bebe Deeps, uh, where parents would write in and ask us questions um, and share their experience about how to deal with whatever they were going through. And one of the messages I got, imagine how long ago this was, via fax. There was a fax machine many years ago. We got messages on television from that machine. And it was a young mother asking me that if she was ready to wean her baby off breast milk, um, if I thought it was a good idea to sprinkle chili on her nipple to get her baby to not want to breastfeed anymore. <laughs> That's when I realized, no wonder everybody's in therapy at 20, taking anxiety and depressants. <laughs> the point is, though, that to be able to host that segment, I had spent a lot of time talking to doctors and reading books and listening to specialists. And on top of that, I was living my own experience day in and day out of being a mother. And I had done everything I possibly could to be the best expert in parenthood. And when I wanted to turn Bebe Thieps into something bigger, and I had decided to launch Bebe Mundo, I went a step further and I started to read everything I could about internet and what it took to run a successful website. I looked at what other people were doing and I put in the necessary work and hours so that I could understand fully what I was trying to achieve. And I did the same when I launched our magazines and all of our consumer product lines. And so when I was sitting there in that restaurant listening to this guy's offer, it wasn't simply an impulse that was telling me, just don't take the half a million dollars. Like we said, intuition isn't something you're just born with. It's a skill that matures. 
Intuition is when all those little pieces of experience, your knowledge and your know-how come together to say, I've got this one before you even have time to start moving. And that's what was telling me to hold on to what I had built. That's what I was listening to. And actually we know now, thanks to people who study behavioral economics and neuroscience, that under the right conditions, human intuition actually is pretty reliable. Like Daniel Kahneman writes in Thinking Fast and Slow, intuition is something very similar to recognition. You aren't just coming up with the right answer out of nowhere. You're realizing that you already know it, but that doesn't mean it's a shortcut, far from it. So the second key to harnessing your intuition, if it isn't clear already, is to do the hard work. The first was to learn to trust yourself. And the third key is something that I think comes naturally for most of us, but that as your careers progress can become easy, very easy to lose sight of. And that is to do something that you truly, with all your heart, believe in. And I want to be very clear that when I say something you believe in, that that could mean absolutely anything. Whatever is that motivates you and that gives you drive and that rush, that's something that you should never, ever let be dictated or constrained by what other people think is right for you or by what other people are doing or by what you think the right thing to be passionate about really is. True passion, true, true passion is so, so personal and unconditional. So what does that mean when we're talking about intuition? Well, um, an amazing writer, Louise Laverne, talks about intuition not as a reflection necessarily of making the right decision or the wrong one, but as making a decision, listen to this, the consequences of which you are at peace with either way. And I think there's a lot of turn and truth into that. In your business, uh, you have to not only know how to make decisions that are most profitable or expedient in the short term, but that are also right for you in a broader sense. Decisions that make you proud, decisions you know you can live with, decisions that speak to your values and your passions. And for me, that lesson was learned very, very early on. The first really formative experience I had with intuition came just after I finished high school. I was 19 and a half. I had done what was expected of me and enrolled actually in a university. I was studying to become a graphic designer because I thought maybe it was the thing I would be best at because of the creative side of it. But my heart truly was never in it and I was dying of boredom. And hello to all the graphic designers out here who might be listening, we love you. And that's because for years, ever since I was 12 years old, I wanted to play music. I wanted to be a radio DJ. So when I was 19, I begged a friend whose dad owned a radio station to give me a chance. And after months and months and months of pestering him, I finally got an audition. And I had literally no idea what I was doing, but I wanted the job so bad that I wrote down every word I had to say on that audition. Hello, welcome to Estereo Cien. My name is Marta de Baile. I literally wrote my name down because I thought I might forget it. <laughs> and as nervous as I was, I actually got the job. I was 19. It was my big break. I was on my way to the top. Obviously, the next step was to drop out of college. Why not? So that's what I did. 
But there was one small, tiny little problem. Eight months after, I got fired. My boss approached me one day and said, listen, you're not very good at this. That's literally what he said. Radio just isn't for you, Martha. I was devastated. And at that point, I could have easily done what my parents told me to do or listened to my boss and said, you know, he's right. That's just not for me. I was just 19. And at 19, your self-esteem is so vulnerable, to say the least. You don't know where you are, who you are. There's not much confidence. And when a grown-up, an expert, the director and owner of a radio station says radio isn't for you, well, he probably knew what he was talking about. I could have drowned out my inner voice. I could have gone back to school. And in many ways, that would have been the logical, reasonable thing to do. And then I would not be here. But the thing is, I just knew deep down inside my gut that radio was my calling. It didn't matter what people said to me, what people thought, because I believed in it. I was passionate about it. I cared about it in a way that I would never, ever care about graphic design or anything else that I could have been studying in a school. And I knew that even, I knew that even if I failed, I was failing at something that I believed in. So what did I do? I held on to what my inner voice was telling me, and I went back at it, tried to get another job, and worked to transform myself into the radio virtuosa I knew I would eventually be. So Dara Harris, an expert in decision making, who works with the Toronto Blue Jays, Red Sox fans here? Red Sox fans, okay. Um, says she says we have two inner voices. One is fear-based, associated with racing, obsessive thoughts, while the other is quieter and truer to your nature. And you know which one is speaking to you by noticing how it makes you feel. She says that your inner voice will always calm you, even in the face of big tasks, while your fear-based voice will increase your feeling of being overwhelmed. So for me, doing what you truly believe in gives that quiet, true voice space to grow, space to take hold. It's that voice that I was following when I was a girl and it's that voice I've tried to follow ever since. Now, three decades later, go figure, after a whole lot of blood, sweat, and tears, I host Mexico's most listened to morning radio show, which reaches millions of listeners every month, and I have an absolute blast doing it. Um, and, and, and I can truly say that I love it as much as I thought I would when I was 12, and I am as dedicated to it now as when I was 19. And if I hadn't insisted in doing something I believe in, I would never be where I am today and in everything I've done since. Radio, television, Bebemundo, eh, cosmetics, you name it. My guiding light is whether or not I believe in what I'm doing. So we've got to trust yourselves and you've got to work hard and believe in what you do. And the last key to harnessing your intuition is know when to trust others. Or put another way, know what you know and know what you don't know. Know the limits of your intuition. I've already hinted at how your intuition can help guard against groupthink or conventional wisdom, but the truth is that nobody's intuition is infallible. Sometimes the people telling you you're wrong are actually right. 
just as research shows us how reliable intuition can be, it is also another way of being self-belief and it can be self-deceiving. It all depends on context. It doesn't matter how much I trust myself to fly a, a plane or run the Boston Marathon. I don't think you want to see me as your pilot and I don't think my knees you know, would get up Heartbreak Hill. I'll trust myself to run a business, but I'm not gonna tell my IT team I have a gut feeling about how to do their jobs. My intuition stops at the server's edge. And that's why the people around you, around me, and learning to trust and make the most of their skills, and yes, their intuition, is nearly as important as trusting your own. And that is why it is so essential to surround yourself with talented people, and especially surround yourself with talented people who know things you don't know, who have experiences that are different from yours, whose perspectives and backgrounds are very diverse. The other aspect of that is understanding where intuition works and where it doesn't. We know, for example, that human intuition is really unreliable at things like guessing statistical outcomes, but that it's immensely powerful in creative processes like, for example, product development. The key is to recognize when and where intuition is enough on its own and when and where it is a complement to analysis, deliberation, and precision. And I'll give you an example. Four years ago, I decided to start expanding the business beyond the media uh, into consumer products. So I launched a home line, my own clothing line, then we moved into hair care products, then eyewear, and the latest one is Marta de Baile Beauty Tech, which we sell at Sephora in, the, in Mexico. And I'm really proud of everything we've achieved. And part of the reason why is that everything we make is an absolute example of intuition and deliberation working together. When we're thinking about a new line, I literally get into a room with my creative team and we throw out ideas for a little bit, we pick them up and settle on the best ones based almost entirely on feel. Our creative process is guided by our intuition. For example, um, lip balm with high pigment crayons. That feels right, it sounds like a great idea, but one thing is that chemistry is not intuitive. So once we've decided to go for the lip balm, high pigmented crayons, or the hair and sculpt detox, we then spend six months, one year, two years, to get the formula exactly right. Then we do focus groups and tests and surveys to see how that product could be made even better. So intuition is a tool, an essential tool, but it is not the only tool. It's a complement to all the expertise of the people you come in contact with, all the things you are learning in school. And in that last part, you obviously have a big leg up on me. You're all learning incredible skills, discovering how to make the most of new tools of analysis and creativity. I didn't have anywhere close to the mastery, for example, of making a business plan or the dexterity with analysis and econometrics that you all have when I was your age. But I'm here anyway, standing in front of you on a beautiful, gloomy, rainy day <laughs> on this incredible campus. And I feel as though I really am following in my Harvard graduate parents. I really am making good for that family the, the things that I saw as a kid, even though I have done it my way. And I'm here because I learned to trust myself, because I always work very, very hard, because I do things I believe in, and because I have an incredible, 
incredible team around me that I've learned to confide into. So I hope you too can have the confidence to find your path and the courage to stay on it no matter the twists and turns. If you can do the same with all the knowledge and all the skills you already have, just imagine the extraordinary things you will achieve with an amazing degree and the power of intuition. Thank you.